Well, good afternoon, friends. Mark Holmes here, and as always, I want to thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Boo Sports Report. Without you guys, as well as you ladies, you know that this literally does not work. It is Monday afternoon, and I hope everybody's having a great Monday. Hope you tune in tonight, 9 o'clock Eastern, for our live stream. As we are getting ready for the draft, we are literally a week and a half away from the draft. The draft, that chance, that opportunity to have those hopes and dreams of finding that future Hall of Famer, to find those pieces that will fill in and make your team maybe that championship team. Everybody has hopes going into the draft, and I've always had lots and lots of hope. And I have a question for you. If the Dallas Cowboys could play defense with the offense short one player, would that be a good idea? You follow what I'm saying? If the Dallas Cowboys defense had 11 guys on the field versus 10 with the opposition, do you think that we would be successful? If there was a way that the Dallas Cowboys could literally have a one-man advantage on the field. You'd say, hell yeah, that'd be a great thing, wouldn't it? Let's do that. Yeah, how, how can we change the rules on that? Well, there's one way you could change the rules on that. And, you know, every year, every year this time of the year, I am pounding the table, pounding my chest, screaming from the tops of the mountains, begging, pleading, for the Dallas Cowboys to do one thing. Just try one thing. We've tried many, many things over the years since our last Super Bowl, you know, from different coaches, different philosophies. I mean, we've brought in so many different guys, different quarterbacks. You know, we've drafted high in the offensive line. We've drafted high in the wide receivers and the linebackers and the cornerbacks. The one thing that the Dallas Cowboys have not tried that they have not done is think about a big man in the middle. I'm not suggesting that the Cowboys sh should trade up. And, you know, of course, we are all like, um, I talk about the movie Shaft. In the movie Shaft, Peebles, I, this, this fits to a T, Jerry Jones. Where people says, you know, Holmes, when I go like this, three people die. Well, that's Jerry Jones when Jerry Jones speaks. And Jerry Jones says, you know, we'd like to move up. You know, everybody goes and gets excited and thinks that's what we're going to do. In the same way, you know, he was talking about, I sure like that Johnny Manziel. You know, when Jerry says stuff, we all go running because that's what we do. In reality, it doesn't often happen the way Jerry Jones makes it out that what we're going to do. But if the Cowboys were to trade up, the thing that I would look at and beg and plead and hope would actually happen would be Jordan Davis. He might, and I say might because there's no guarantees on anybody or anything, he might be that generational talent that, Reggie White type of a guy that ends up changing a franchise's destiny. You could look at Reggie White going to the Green Bay Packers, bringing the Green Bay Packers back to being title town USA. Reggie White was that transformative. You can look at the Rams with what they've done with Aaron Donald. People give, oh, Matthew Stafford, you know, credit. and you No, know, it's Aaron Donald, that defense. If Aaron Donald doesn't do what he does down there on that last drive, um, you know, stopping him, they're not winning the Super Bowl. He is that dominant. And the thing is about interior defensive guys is there's so much stuff that they do that the average casual fan knows nothing about. And if you have a good one, a really good one, it's literally like the defense is playing against 10 guys because 
they're that dominant where they literally take out one of the guys. They, they're, they're literally they're taking two guys on, occupying so much space, and making everybody better. You know, people, oh, take a corner. No, screw the cornerback. Get me the space eater that will destroy things. I've talked about Jordan Davis many times before in, in, you know, dream because, you know, you look at this and say, he ain't falling our, you know, far enough for us or we're not going to make a move for that. But then again, who saw us getting C.D. Lamb? Who saw us getting Micah? Those were guys that weren't expected to be there. So you never know. So you can always dream and until Thursday night, until Thursday night, we can still have that dream. But I've told you, in my mind, all the things that a defensive tackle, a, a, a nose tackle can do, or nose guard, as I actually like to refer to him, because he, he's like a traditional nose guard. They help every single level. And I saw this great breakdown here. Some of the things that I've told you guys about. They break it down. I want to actually show this from ESPN. Shout out to them. This is what ESPN used to really be to me. ESPN was the information to give you the statistics, the numbers, the looks, and things like that, and allow you to make your own opinion as opposed to being the reality show. I want to go through this because this is a great breakdown and, and give you some other thoughts from being a guy who had to play that position. It is exceedingly rare to find a defensive lineman anywhere close to Jordan Davis' size that can play on every down. But the hulking 22-year-old is out to prove what he's shown throughout last season Jordan at the Cubs, that he's unlike almost any other player in this year's draft. All I got to say is, can't no O-line in the nation stop him. It's the first round. Jordan Davis had the football world buzzing during the NFL scouting combine as a 341-pound defensive tackle from Georgia ran a 40-yard dash faster than the like of Patrick Mahomes, mm -hmm. Nick Bosa, and J.J. Watt, each at least 50 pounds lighter than Jordan Davis. But the impact of Davis's game is far greater than his other worldly combine measurements. Swallow While his combination of size and speed is rare, it's his power, lateral agility, instincts, and pursuit that made him one of the most feared players in college football. Mm. On a Georgia defense littered with future pros, it was Davis who won the Bagneric Award in 2021, awarded to the best defensive player in all of college football. All right, we're gonna start here with Jordan Davis, who is playing where you see him frequently, right over the nose. This is a college football playoff game against a really good Michigan offensive line. And Okay, before he gets into his stuff, I want to give you my take on things here. Now, see, <clears throat> when you are in the defense like this, okay, you've got outside linebackers, okay? You've got outside linebackers. You have two inside linebackers, middle linebackers. you got a strong side, weak side linebacker. The guy that is pivotal and key in here is that guy in the middle, okay? Because if he does his job, he is going to prevent at least one of those guards from being able to get there and hit the linebacker. And this is what I mean by saying that that guy in the middle, if he's good, is like taking a player off the field. And if... The guard can't go over there and have to and block the linebacker. The linebacker doesn't have to shed the block and scrape to make the play. It's easier for them to do their job. So what happens for a lot of times, and people don't see, they see numbers like, oh, he's got you know thirty tackles and you know five sacks. That's nothing. No, it's because it's not designed for him to get the glory. It's a tough position because you get hit by the right guard left guard, the center, the fullback. If there's a fullback, you get wham blocked. You get influence blocked by the tackles coming down. You you literally, it, it's it's war. It, there, there is no position on the field that you take more abuse than this spot. But there's no more point that's more pivotal because if you can control the middle of this field right there, you control the field flat out. All right, let's go to the film breakdown. As a nose tackle, a lot of what Jordan Davis is going to get paid to do in the NFL is dirty work. It's stuff that doesn't show up in the box score. 
But what makes him unique as you watch this play is not just the fact that he can do the dirty work of occupying two blockers, which helps these two outstanding linebackers. Georgia had great linebacking play last year. Get space to work, but also make the play himself. As you watch this, you're going to see it quickly. You've got two Michigan players occupying or trying to occupy Jordan Davis with a double team. It works for a second, and then it does not. As Jordan Davis, again, able to uncover right here. This is a play that, hypothetically, if it's going to get blown up, it should be by somebody not named Jordan Davis. What he does basically eats that double team, makes a play, and stuffs this for basically no yard. That power, so unique from Jordan Davis, but there's also not just a technique element to what he does, but a selflessness. It's doing the dirty work that, again, does not always show up in the box. And let me elaborate on that as well, because here's what, it, what it's called. It's a read and react technique. Okay, and what it is is using your arm strength in here, you're trying to get a hold of the body, and you're going to end up, first of all, you've got to keep your shoulders square to the line. You feel the pressure, as in, where is the offensive lineman trying to push me? And you want to fight the pressure. You want to be able to lock out and keep him from being able to turn his shoulders, and you want to fight where he is trying to take me, and because that's going to lead me to the ball. The double team here, what's supposed to happen with the left guard is he's supposed to basically chip him, you know, get him turned, get the momentum going, and then go on to the linebacker to try and get that extra, you know, touchdown alley lane set up. But because Jordan Davis feels that pressure and is able to lock out, he realizes, okay, you know, his hips are trying to get swiveled. They're trying to get the hips swiveled here to turn me that way. I've got to go there because that's going to lead me to the ball. And that's exactly what happens. It leads him to the ball. And to be able to take on that double team, he has now occupied those two guys. That guy can't, the guard can't get to the linebacker, and he gets the ball carrier. You can't ask for anything more than that. But let's go on some more. We run things forward here. Again, one more time, uh, Jordan Davis aligned up sort of in between the center and the guard. This is against Georgia Tech, a team that ran the triple option, so big, wide gaps between these offensive linemen. And this is not easy on somebody like Jordan Davis. These guys are much smaller than him. The Georgia Tech offensive line is 75 pounds lighter on average than Jordan Davis. But they're going to make him work. And watch him right here. Just watch the footwork and the ability to stay square at the line of scrimmage and, again, disrupt a play. You're going to run it here. And just this power. Watch, look at these two arms right here, locked out. And the importance of being able to lock Elliot, out an opposing offensive lineman fight the is pressure. that, A, you're stunting his vertical progress. He's trying to get up the field to push you back. But, B, once you lock him out, you create a two-way go. If this running back takes the ball this way, Jordan Davis can meet him there. If this running back takes the ball that way, Jordan Davis can take him there. The fact that he can control an offensive lineman at the point of attack like that makes him so unique. And while he gets just an arm on this running back, that's, all that's you about need. all he needs right here. This might be the strongest right arm in college football as Jordan Davis makes opposing players look like flies when he brings them down <laughs> like on that. the field. Court. This might be the most impressive play from Jordan Davis that you're going to see. Oh, this He's I highlighted love, there I love in the this. middle of the field. And people are saying, you know, who cares about a 40-yard dash that was in the four sevens? Well, it may not matter on every play, but it might matter on a few. Quarterback, right there. Jordan Davis, right there. 341 pounds, a reminder. Watch this play as it breaks down. A little bit of pressure. Okay, one more time. Pursuit Jordan angles. Davis, right here. Quarterback, so far off your screen, I can't even circle him appropriately. This is second in about 10 or 10 or 9 or 10 yards. Watch this play from Jordan Davis. Look at him moving on the run. My man is hustling right here to meet this quarterback and try to stop him short of a first down. 341 pounds. Now listen, the quarterback gets a first down. As you see a second replay that we'll get back to in just a second. He may get about a first down here, but that's where the speed shows up for Jordan Davis. All right, this right here is one of the things that, if you remember our defense in 2020, it drove me crazy. You know, when you started seeing, uh, like, the Odell Beckham Jr. run that he had um, with uh, when he was with the Browns, where at the end of the game, you know, we we're, we're made a comeback, we're, we're, in, we're in a chance and everything else. If we could just get a stop, then we got a chance to maybe win this game. 
But Odell literally just get it's just like guy after guy just runs past him and runs out of bounds, or you know they they end up doing this banana route. It's called pursuit angle. And if you've ever shot a shotgun, okay, when you shoot a shotgun, you're not shooting at the target. You're shooting where the target's going to be because it's got it takes time for the to get out there. If you're shooting at the target, you're going to miss it. And we used to have this drill that I hated. I hated it because I was a nose guard. And it was pursuit angles. The coach would get there with the football, you know, and he would go, go. And what you did was you were running to your spot on the field. And for us as defensive linemen, because we were, you know, slower running, our point of attack was further down the field. If you're a linebacker, it was flatter. So what it basically is is you, you're going – the closest point between two points is a straight line. And so you're making that straight line to where he's going to be. We have had terrible pursuit angles. And see, the thing is, is you'll see a guy say, whoa, he caught up so quick. Well, it wasn't that he was that fast per se. It's because he's running in a straight line over there. The other guy is bending wide and having to run further. So it looks like, they're running so much faster, although Jordan Davis at 4'8 does run pretty pretty damn fast. But let's go on. I'm sorry to keep interrupting, but this is my passion here of, of seeing the perfect nose tackle. And that's part of the pass rush skill set. He can close and chase like a guy that's like 60 pounds lighter than he is. One more look just to appreciate what Jordan Davis does. Again, this right here, quarterback, this right here. 341 pound defensive lineman not supposed to be able to catch up and close on a quarterback like he does pretty unique stuff right there from jordan davis and then just for fun i want you all to know that jordan davis Fullback. handled the football as well <laughs> i don't even really i don't really need to spotlight him but just for fun here is a 99 in the backfield which means jordan davis is invoking his inner refrigerator perry and he plunges it in for the touchdown maybe not the most graceful one yard touchdown you're ever going to see Oh, I love Jordan it. Jordan Davis, the a big man guy. and a playmaker wrapped into one. So that's to get at least, and, and shout out to ESPN. That was an incredible breakdown. But these are things that I've been telling you guys about that uh, the reason that I say you must get a great defensive tackle because he makes everything better across the line. The fact that he's occupying the space you know, keeping the guards from getting out to the linebackers. If you end up having Micah Parsons as a middle linebacker and he's got a guy like that in front of him, he can see everything and he will be right to the ball. If you got a guy like Jordan Davis right there, can you just imagine this for a second here? You've got Micah Parsons as a middle linebacker. You've got Jordan Davis right there who's already got the guard in the center like, man, this guy is a raging bull that, uh, you know, we can't stop. And then you creep Micah Parsons up into that guard center gap. You don't think that quarterback is now all of a sudden going, Dafa? You don't think that he's not thinking about how quickly can I get rid of that football? How quickly can I get out of here? Or let's say you put him, I mean, he's right there, and you got Micah Parsons on the outside of D-Law. The amount of pressure that you're going to be able to bring and bear on there, or just say bull rush, collapse the pocket so the quarterback can't step up. Because there's nothing worse for a quarterback than having pressure in their face. They, they can't get comfortable. And this is why I look at it and say, if you were to trade up, that's the guy to go get. And I've been wanting that type of guy forever. Um, Calais Campbell. He was one of those kind of guys in his younger years. He's more of a role player now. But um, that's the kind of guy that you get that is a difference maker. I know the Cowboys will probably take a wide receiver or a cornerback or something like that. But I'm telling you, that's the guy that will lead you to a Super Bowl. And with that being said, I just hope that we're not doing this draft night.